Good afternoon, Sainath, and uh, thanks uh, a million for joining me. Good afternoon, Frank. Um, Prime Minister Modi is set to extend um, a very strict uh, lockdown for, I guess, another few weeks. Maybe he's done it already, but yesterday he was set to, to do that. Can you tell us what this lockdown um, has meant for migrant workers in India? It has been devastating for migrant workers, but not only for them. See, in the last 20 years, there's been huge levels of out-migration from the villages. Now, this is not as people imagine everybody migrating from a village to the big metro. There are many kinds of migrations. There a lot, a lot of it is rural to rural migration. The worst kind, because these are footloose migrants. They have no security of what they're going to find at the destination. Will they get a job? Will they get work? They don't know. Now, millions of them have moved into small towns, cities, other areas, rural towns, big metros, millions and millions over the last 15, 20 years, which is the same period, 25 years, during the period of India's tryst with neoliberalism, which has seen us acquire land, displace people all over the countryside. Now, these migrant laborers all function in the informal sector. They have no rights, no these things, horrible wages, terrible living conditions. Now, let's say construction workers in a city, they usually in India live at the site. Now, all those sites are shut down. Where do they go? Then, there are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people who have come in from rural areas working horrible jobs like the sanitation workers. Don't understand that word in a European sense. A sanitation worker in India is someone who might be dealing with shit with their hands. Okay? The sanitation worker in India is someone who gets down into the sewer, into the manholes, into the septic tanks. Now these, now these used to be government jobs at one time. 20 years ago, we privatized all these, outsourced it to private parties, who then rehired the same sanitation workers without benefits and at lower wages. Now, where do they go? We have millions and millions of women, migrant women working as uh, domestic servants or domestic workers, domestic help. Where do they go? Suddenly, without any preparation, without any warning, without preparing a nation for it mentally, you announce a nationwide lockdown. You're talking about 1.3 billion women. Now, this could have been done very differently. When they knew the first cases, they could simply have shut down at the airports. You could have shut down all the airports, and you would have had to look for a very finite number of people who had come in in the last 18 days, 20 days. But we never do that because, you know, this virus was brought in by us, by the flying classes not by the people living in the villages or the migrant workers. It's very typically Indian elite policy to punish them for what we have done. It's, it's very Indian. Okay. So now you have these migrant workers panic, okay? And then their buildings, their construction sites are telling them, okay, you're up, get out of here. Now housing societies, middle-class housing societies are where Hundreds of thousands of these people work as security guards, as menial laborers, as cleaners. Suddenly, and all the domestic servants and women, workers, suddenly these societies, these buildings are walling up and telling them don't come. Now, so people, where are they going to eat? There's no wages, no work, no food. Announcements are made, Mr. Modi makes 
frequent announcements about how, what he's going to do for people. Unfortunately, you can't eat TV announcements. So then people started walking back towards their homes. There are people walking hundreds of kilometers along the highway trying to reach their villages. Now these guys have taken a three-way hit, men, women, and children, they've taken a three-way hit. First, the panic caused by the announcement saying, in another so many hours, you know, they're all locked down, meant that people left their shelters, left their jobs, lost their jobs, lost their security, lost their place that they had to sleep at the construction site, and headed for the highways. Sometimes thinking, dreaming that they will reach, walk 1,000 kilometers or 1,500 kilometers. Migrant laborers in Bangalore trying to reach Bengal from here, you know, southwest to, uh, to Bengal in the east. Anyway, now what happens on the highway? The, what, what we have done, these, there are so many ways in which migrants take a hit. One, you could have a, there's a fair chance that more people with the situation in the countryside, not just migrants, more people will die of traditional old Indian diseases than of COVID because 100% the hospitals and medical resources are focused on COVID. So a person, there are cases in the city of people Diabetics dying for lack of immediate treatment required. Okay, heart patient, cardiac uh, patient dying because they're not able to get it. In People's Archive of Rural India, the website I set up and run, we have a story outside one of India's, probably India's most famous cancer hospital, cancer treatment hospital, the Tata Memorial Hospital. You can look at it. They're a wonderful hospital good people. It's a private trust, but aided mostly by government. And because they do things so well and so reasonably, people come from far off villages to get themselves treated there. Do you know those patients are now sleeping on the pavements? Cancer patients are sleeping in large, significant numbers on the pavements outside the hospitals. Yeah, because the lodges where they might have stayed are shut down. Some of them anyway stayed on the pavements, but now they're staying without food. Then the, they can't go back to their villages. There are no trains, no buses, nothing. Much. Then the migrants on the highway. Frank, even before, you know that I think, I let me do a little uh, uh, bragging here. The People's Archive of Rural India didn't discover migrant problems from the day of the lockdown. These are the people we cover. 365 days a year, migrants and other poor agents. Migrants, it's very, it was, middle classes didn't know anything about the migrants who worked for them. Now they're figuring out who the Indian workforce is, that it's not the bright boys of Silicon Valley in Bengaluru, but poor people from the countryside. Now when, suppose you were working in uh, my little factory in Mumbai, and you were a very poor guy. When your vacation period came, which could be because I was taking my holiday in Switzerland, you walked back home, okay? 200, 300 kilometers. But there was a way you could do it. The way was, you would walk 20, 30, 40 kilometers and come across a tea stall, a dhaba, a highway, a highway restaurant of an Indian kind, okay? In shed, all that kind of stuff. You would work for the guy there that night. You would earn your meal and a place to sleep. Then in the morning, you would set out while it was still cool, walk 30, 40 kilometers to the next Daba eating place, a bus stand, interstate bus stand, and at the bus depot, there would be more dabas, more tea stalls. You worked your way home as you walked your way home. Now, all those places are shut. Now, you start walking, and this time, you're trying to cover 
500 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers, these places are shut. You're going to die of dehydration, diarrhea. Well, even if you don't die of them, you're certainly going to be affected by them very badly. Yeah. So this that's one huge set of ways in which they hit. Second, after realizing the damage they'd done without admitting it, the same government gave orders to state governments to stop these people at the borders and not go back. I was saying from day one, the migrants should be persuaded not to go back because if any of them has got it from us, you're going to create community transmission into a nightmare in the country. I said that all the schools and colleges and hostels and marriage halls that are now empty and shut should be declared as shelters for migrants and homeless. And when we have them there, we can deliver food to them. We have an address. You can't go around the highway looking for someone and handing him a food packet. That, but they stopped them there. Wherever they were, they've been stopped there. There are serious problems of hunger coming up. Third, when they have been allowed to go back to their home villages, guess what? Many of the villages, the panic created around this, many of the villages have put up barricades. You can see stories on that. Not allowing, you, you say you are wanting to go to your village through my village. I don't allow you passage. If you are from my village, I still make your entry difficult. Because I don't know. I mean, I don't want my kids to get into trouble. So, you know, you we, everybody is interpreting quarantine rules his own way. Politically, it means that every local two paisa tin pot is calling the shots, making rules. Authoritarian power is being exercised by anyone in any position of power. Interpretations of quarantine, whatever. So they're taking a third hit when they reach home. And everybody in the countryside, that's another, but this was migrants. There's every other section is badly hurt. Farmers, everybody. Yes, when I when I heard about the lockdown that Modi was uh, putting in place, um, you know, if you ask people to social distance themselves in Brussels, uh, it's one thing. Then ask them for social distancing in uh, an India. You know, I've been to India, one of the slums of India, or a place as cramped as India and where the health services are, are not up to scratch. Uh, how, how, how practical it, it, it is to actually implement this lockdown. And also, it looks like it's only the beginning of the epidemic in India, right? Apparently, like the next few weeks could be very, like could be terrible. What, what do you think about that? We don't know anything about it because we have been testing so little. I have no faith in the numbers that we are looking at. We have tested very little compared to almost any other big country, right? So we don't know. Uh, we we don't know what the real picture would be if we were testing big time. As I said, we had the opportunity to lock down at the airports, but that would be troubling the beautiful people. Now, uh, in the uh, Sorry, your your before you asked me about this thing, your early the first part of your question was about uh, how how practical such a lockdown is is in India, a place about which is so basic. yeah. Firstly, I find that word social distancing extremely offensive. For millions of Indians, they have known social distancing for 2,000 years. They just called it caste. Yeah? Where people were, where millions of people, 16% uh, uh, of your population were considered untouchables and still faced that practice and discrimination. So social, I think the government, I think Kerala, where a left government exists, gave a beautiful alternative. They said, don't call it this. What you should be asking for is not social distancing. You should be asking for 
social unity and physical distancing. Now, in the slums of Mumbai, where you have been, or other parts of India, that's simply impossible. Okay, in Mumbai, in uh, you can have in one room tenements, you can have eight to ten people staying. Okay, you can have eight to ten people staying. What distancing will you achieve? In Bangalore, there are we we have been talking as uh, one of our Fari fellows, People's Archive fellows. A filmmaker, she has been talking to a group of 180, 200 Bengali migrants in Bangalore from the east to the south. And you know how, where these 180 people live? They live on the roofs of three buildings. They pay a rent for that and they live on the open roofs. Now, the owners of those buildings ask them to leave the moment. So she's been negotiating and talking to them and persuaded. She and her friends have persuaded a couple of owners to hold on, saying that this is not a good idea. Now, just tell me, how are 180 people in three roofs of buildings? How much physical distancing or social distancing can they practice? Third, the profession. Now, we have a very recent story. There is a caste in India. For every occupation, there is a caste, right? And then tell me what happens to a caste that numbers millions, but is very tiny in each village, a caste of barbers, hairdressers. They are very low caste. They're very discriminated, very oppressed. Now, what physical distancing can you do in an occupation like that? Or what physical distancing can the hundreds of thousands of sex workers in the country practice? in the kind of conditions they live in and with their clients. So you've got impossible situations for lots of people in particular occupational and for millions of people in cramped spaces. So it's not, again, I'm saying it should have been a targeted, focused quarantining, starting at the airports, tracing those who had come in the last 18 days, those buildings, those now they are, but some states are saying we are going to handle this differently. We are going to have zones. That, yeah, last night, even the union government is saying, yeah, red zone, green zone, orange zone. I haven't a clue how that will work out because they never clarify what they mean. And on the ground, it's some thick headed cop who's as scared of everything as you are and I am who's got to deal with it, how are they going to interpret it? More importantly, two things. One is the food situation. That's deteriorating very fast. At least if you had them in proximity, you could deliver food. You can't because you've scattered them everywhere. Hunger is gaining ground very, very fast. We have seen three, four major protests as people have come out on the streets since the cops were not allowing them to leave and buy vegetables. Soon there may be no vegetables. Who knows? Because the supply chains have broken down. Then you've got the, that's that's one set of things. The so you could have done this very differently. We didn't. Finally, at last, I'd like to ask them: What do you think, or where do you think we will be, or Indians will be? In, in one or two months in terms of um, the sort of strict rule um, of the sort of Modi government. We know the discrimination against Muslims. We know um, the uh, against activists, uh, etc. Uh, do you think the after COVID um, could lead to something better in a way for India or I mean for the people of India or do you think the authoritarianism of the Modi government will go even further? I, I think this is pretty much a discussion going on around the world as a lot of fellow progressives tell themselves and us well it can't go back to business as usual you know you've got to rethink neoliberalism all this is true and it's all what I would like to see what I am seeing and what I do foresee, 
I foresee that you will, that the, just take, go back to 2008, the Wall Street collapse. What happened after that? You had, by the way, you did have, the Arab Spring was linked to the price of bread that went up tremendously. But you had the very people responsible for the tanking of the global economy getting trillions of dollars in bailouts and getting richer than they were before the collapse and inequality, if you look at the Forbes list of billionaires, grows even more after 2008. Take India. In 1991, when we entered our brave new embrace of neoliberalism, India did not have a single dollar billionaire, not one. Or maybe somebody very modest was being quiet about it, but not one. In 2008, nine, the year of the collapse, India had, we, we went into neoliberalism, right? India had, uh, in, in, two, in 2008, nine, it had about $40 billionaires. In 2012, it had 53, and in 2018, we had 121 billion dollar billionaires. That's hell of a lot than more than many West European countries put together. Hmm? Um, that's more than more than twice all the Nordic countries put together. We had 121 dollar billionaires, but ours are more special than anyone else's. They account for 22.5, they account for 22% of India's GDP. The equivalent of their wealth is 22%. A fifth, more than a fifth of India's and close to a fourth of India's GDP. So that inequality actually trebled and quadrupled after 2008. Now when you're coming out of this, millions of people jobless and all that all that we've been doing on COVID in the establishment is playing Hindu-Muslim politics, targeting minorities. This is the game. This, this is what is going to happen. It's going to get more acute. There are gigantic uh, number WhatsApp offensives and quite a lot of people who believe that some great Islamic conspiracy brought the uh, COVID uh, the virus to India, a lot of people believe this shit. Okay? Um, so you're going to see a move towards further authoritarianism, and not just in India, but everywhere in the world, because you are, you live in the age of rapidly expanding mass surveillance, which now has a justification. It's for you, right? We're doing it to save your ass. And people are going to be more accepting of that. On the other hand, on the other hand, people are not going to be so accepting, I think, of the kind of devastation and depredations on their economic and financial status. Because they're going to lose massively. They're going to be broke. Or you know that a, a, we, you keep, I mean, whenever the West looks at India, they're looking at the IT sector and things like that in India. The IT is nowhere the biggest employer in this country. Agriculture is the biggest employer in this country. After agriculture, guess what? Handlooms and handicrafts are the biggest employers in this country. Okay? We're talking about millions and millions. All those have been smashed by the lockdown completely. It's not just migrant laborers. Farmers are sitting with their crop from the winter crop, the rubby season, is rotting on the fields. They can't get transportation or they are forced to sell at less than what they paid to produce it. Farm laborers are without work. They can't report anywhere for work. All these sections are taking, I mean, it's not as if life was heaven before, but they are taking a terrible hit. So there will be repercussions, but the political outcome of those repercussions can, I suppose, depends on how much of a resistance builds up. But it could be very bad. 
I'm lo you're looking at an age of fundamentalism and obscurantism. Let me tell you that India is run by an alliance. It's run by an alliance of socio-religious fundamentalists on the one hand and economic market fundamentalists on the other. And a substantial number of these have one foot in both. And these alliance of religious fundamentalists and market fundamentalists, the bed they cohabit is what you and I call the corporate media. So yeah, someday it will get better, but it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better.